Well, hello and welcome to this panel on green and sustainability linked finance, uh, the last event in our Sustainable and Responsible Capital Markets Forum 2020. After a long period of growth and gradual maturing, this market has entered a phase of rapid change and innovation. Several developments are happening all at once. As we've heard today, the European Union's taxonomy and the green bond standard that depends on it are finally coming into force. Sovereign green bond issuance has gone from a rarity to the norm. Pretty soon, most of the big economies in Europe will be programmatic green bond issuers. This is part of the conquest of the last parts of the debt market that had not been much affected by green investing, the super liquid and very short term instruments with green commercial paper even appearing. More exciting still are the efforts to create a transition bond market. Whether you like or mistrust this idea, it is bringing a keener debate about what kinds of transition towards lower carbon technologies should be considered rapid enough. The same issue is at stake in a different way in sustainability, in sustainability linked bonds and loans. The idea of linking financing conditions to specific uh, sustainability targets has the potential to apply to pretty well every capital markets issuer. But can it be done rigorously? And would that help to focus investors and issuers' minds on the complex challenges of sustainability? Well, um, to answer those questions and more, I'm delighted to say we have a fantastic set of panelists for you. Why don't we meet them, first of all? And we'll start with Yarek. Uh, uh, hi, my name is Yarek Olszówka. I'm the head of sustainable finance at Nomura, sitting within the investment banking division as part of the syndicate team. And as such, I focus on uh, origination, structuring, execution of uh, ESG bonds globally and, uh, and outside of Japan uh, mainly. And uh, currently we sit on the ICMA Advisory Council, uh, advising a number of the fellow panelists. So very happy to be here. Thank you. Shrey? Oh, thank you, Toby. Uh, so my name is Shrey Kohli. I'm head of debt capital markets and investment funds at the London Stock Exchange Group. Uh, and within my responsibility is also to head up the exchange's sustainable bond market. So we spend a lot of time with issuers and advisors uh, on early stages of the origination process and also the process of listing bonds. Uh, and like the Eric, uh, we also sit on the advisory council to uh, the green and social bond principles. Thank you. Uh, Tongi. Hello, my name is Tanguy Klekin. I manage the sustainable banking team at Credit Agricole, so taking care of all projects with um, social or environmental component within the investment bank at Credit Agricole. And I'm also a member of the XCOM of the Green Bond Principle, and I was one of the coordinators of the Sustainability Link Bond Working Group, which designed the Sustainability Link Bond Principle, which were published at the last AGM. Um, and uh, I've been involved in a number of those transactions. Thank you, Tonki. Uh, Alessandro. Hello, everybody. I'm Alessandro Canta. I'm a head of finance and insurance at Enel. Uh, we are in almost 40 countries and leading a team of 360 people around the world. Thank you. And last but definitely not least, Ashley. <laughs> Uh, hi, Toby. Thanks for having me. I'm Ashley Schulten. I'm the head of responsible investing for fixed income at BlackRock. Um, my team works on all sorts of ESG topics around the fixed income space, and I'm a portfolio manager on sustainably tilted fixed income funds. I'm also a member of the executive committee for the Green Bond Principles. Okay, super. Thank you very much. Right. I'd like to um, start with uh, our first question. Um, and um, and I think just to get us get us moving, I think um, I'll direct this to Yarek, but everyone else is welcome to join in, of course. But um, green and sustainability linked bond and loan borrowing has dipped during the crisis, though not gone away altogether. Does this mean that when bad times come, these products are a nice to have rather than truly essential? Yeah. First of all, I, I would caveat that uh, they haven't dipped anymore. If you if you look at the latest numbers, it's uh, actually last last week. Finally, the 2020 year to date issuance of green has uh, caught up and and at the moment uh, surpassed the 2019 year to date volumes. Uh, but I think we've certainly seen a lot of evolution in the market and 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 overall the the ESG bonds have grown and uh, significantly diversified in terms of type of products and 
uh, of course, the focus being on uh, the ascending social social bonds and sustainability bonds, which in past years they, they used to be a five percent of the ESG bond universe. The, this this year they have grown exponentially. Year to date, there has been more social bond issuance than in all the previous years put together. So. Uh, I'm not sure, Toby, I would agree with your thesis. There was a dip, but I would say it was more of a temporary blip when uh, in, in a few specific months and at the beginning of the crisis. Okay. Uh, Tongi, so yeah, would, is that a nice uh, remark? Or... Yeah, I fully agree. Fully agree with Jarek. Uh, it's a question of ratio. Um, the, I mean, the, 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 the ratio of Greenborn overall the overall sustainable debt market has has decreased because uh, we have seen a, a, a very strong growth of social and sustainability bonds and sustainability linked bonds to come. So, in fact, uh, the ratio of green bonds over the rest seems smaller, but I would not say that it has dipped. Uh, in fact, the market keeps on being very, very dynamic. Uh, and, I, and I would not say that it's uh, a nice to have. I would say on the contrary, we have seen by a number of players that uh, green bonds are now, or green or social or sustainability bonds, are now part of the funding tools that some issuer uh, use now on a very regular basis. Uh, and I expect it to become the same for sustainability linked bonds going forward too. Okay, Ashley, from where you sit on the investor side, um, did you see a drop off in things being shown to you, or uh, activity in general, or or um, or, or not? Uh, so it's definitely true that I think the social bonds got the spotlight. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think I would um, I would say that that means in a in, in a crisis situation we've never lived through one of these before. I wouldn't extrapolate. You know, um, a few months to uh, to market themes, but social bonds definitely um, they definitely got the spotlight. Um, although, as Eric said, green bonds have you know started to come back. Um, and we've seen some very high profile issuers, you know, even in the last couple of weeks, you know, with Germany in the market as well. So, um, yeah. so I don't think it indicates that there's a slowdown in green bond issuance at all. Uh, okay. All right. Um, anyone else have a, have a view on that? If, uh, if I may, I totally agree with what uh, we have said so far. So it's quite normal that during uh, a crisis like this one, it is uh, a social crisis, a pandemic crisis. Uh, the very first uh, step uh, could be eventually for all the company just to revise the project uh, or the investment by which uh, most likely the green bond has been uh, put on hold for some months, uh, nothing more. Meanwhile, uh, social bond and the other instrument that give a little bit more of uh, elasticity in this period of time, especially for liquidity, let me say for the SDG link loans, probably have made a step up. So we, but we are, as we have commented, our colleague commented, we are sure that uh, this is not the stop of a path, uh, I'm sure. And we are sure that everything will come back to normality with the, the normal growth path that we have seen in the last years. Okay, I think all right. So we just, uh, if, if, you, if you look at some other asset classes as well, uh, you know, when you've seen uh, companies raise equity um, to fund green projects, um, you know, they've done so. So Calizen, which is a smart metering company, uh, got the green equities, green economy mark earlier this year and did market it to investors uh, as part of their capital raising. Uh, you've had a number of investment funds with strategies in energy efficiency, which have raised further, further capital uh, during the crisis as well. So even though the ratio of green bonds may be lower, that doesn't mean that it's part of the that it, it isn't part of the mainstream anymore. I would say that's true across tech as well as other asset classes, including you. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. So, um, so what has the crisis shown us about the green and sustainable bonds and how they performed compared with other bonds? Tongi, start with you there. Uh, I think in terms of performance. Um, uh, we have not observed anything specific for green and social bonds in terms of performance during the crisis, um, to be frank. I mean, if you look at there are some anecdotal evidences, some bonds would uh, trade tighter, some a bit wider. Globally speaking, we could make an average where the green bonds and social bonds would be a little bit tighter, but uh, really this is not always very statistically significant. So I would say the, the main lesson for the crisis for me is not so much on the pricing. The main lesson of the crisis is more on the, the value of the principle that we have put on the table. I would say that um, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, we have seen a bit like a, 
a biodiversity explosion and with a number of different structures uh, with or without the use of proceed, with or without the framework and so on. And we see that there is like a convergence toward the social bond principle um, because investors are calling for it. And, and so it means that the, the best practices that we have worked on together at the at uh, the green bond and social bond principle are very valid. In terms of pricing, uh, I would say the main lesson has come after the, the crisis for me with what Germany did. Um, I'm a bit biased because I spent a lot of time on this, but uh, it's true that uh, this twin bond approach where they have issued two bonds with exactly the same characteristics or a green bond having exactly the same characteristics as a twin is a, is a lesson, I would say, of um, uh, the absolute value of the, of the difference in a green bond and, in, in a, and a normal bond uh, or a standard bond is green bond, um, which has a value. It's not it's not ten basis points as you, as you could read in some papers. Sometimes uh, it's much less. It's very it's very small, one basis point, but it's there. And so I think um, this is a les lesson I would say for the highly rated part of the market for the AAA and, and SSA world. Um, that I would say come after the crisis. It's not really related to the crisis, but I think it's one of the lessons. That is interesting for for the for for the coming years, and I think the willingness of Germany to build the curve, not the topic of this um, this forum, but I think it's something that uh, will have long-lasting consequences for the market if they manage to, and I think they will manage to have very rapidly a number of highly liquid points uh, in the mid to long in, in the short to mid term. Okay, um, Ashley, what Tongi is describing that does that echo with, with how you've seen things? It does. You know, we we um, run an analysis on a daily basis, an automated analysis of all the green bonds that we mark and where we see them trading. And we uh, we agree, we don't see any significant tightening, maybe a little bit. Um, it's less than a handful of basis points. It does exist um, sometimes more strongly in euro-based issues from euro-denominated investors. And you know, we can decide on, you know, maybe there's a stronger buyer base, you know, for that. Um, I think one thing that's you know interesting to point out is you know in this um, in this crisis we did see um, a lot of changes in flows to funds, and so um, you know, there was some you know some inflows into funds, outflows into funds, and our green bond funds um, did not experience any kind of liquidity issue with that. And so I think it's really reassuring that the market has gotten big enough. Um, you know now we have an ETF of green bonds um, to support the kind of fl funds flows that happen um, when 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 markets are offside. Okay. And yeah, Alessandro, please. If I may say, uh, the crisis has taken a lot of bad things, but uh, on the market, uh, from a market standpoint, has pointed out that the sustainable companies uh, has been more resilient than anybody else. So uh, I think that we, with the crisis, uh, I mean, we're going to see a lot of possible candidates for making of the sustainable finance a mainstream. Uh, at whatever form it's possible, with whatever form it's possible, doesn't mean uh, if we're going to be transition, social, SDG link, or uh, or green bond. But I think that uh, a lot of companies realize this more than any 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 other times in in our life that uh, uh, being sustainable uh, has got a, as a premium in respect of uh, the performance of the other one in terms of results, in terms of stock performance, and most likely also in terms of the bond performance. By which uh, I'm, I hope and I'm sure that we're going to have find a lot of candidates for increasing potentially the path of sustainable finance. Sure. Um, how about you, Yarek? Um, um, uh, I, I would, yeah, I mean, it's hard to disagree with anything that's that's been said, but I, I, I would just highlight that significant further that diversification, both in terms of products and, and type of issuers. If, for example, if we if we look at social bonds, uh, which were very SSA driven markets, similar to green bonds historically, now 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 you look at social bonds, you you have financials issuing, you have lots of banks now issuing tests, part of the COVID response. Uh, you have increasingly more non-financial corporates coming to the market. So, in 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 a, in a way, to me, it's also a sign of further maturation of the of the market that it's it's growing both in terms of types of products and and also where it's coming from yeah okay um and i'm just interested though during at the height of the crisis were and i guess alessandro let's start with you here but um did you or and indeed i'd like to hear the experience of others who have looked after their clients are, are, did you or, or other bond issuers 
find that investors are more interested in their ESG performance than before, or, or are they more worried about credit quality? Uh, no, I think that uh, there is a convergence in place uh, that everybody is looking for. Uh, we have, uh, as NL, have done a, a big step on it, trying to integrate as much as possible the sustainability report with the balance sheet. Yeah. And as you were saying, uh, the investors are very much concerned uh, about the reporting, uh, the way in which you present your company. Uh, for sure, the credit is uh, still the basic of their, of their uh, choice, but in any case, uh, the ESG part is growing and growing more in their concern. Uh, up to the moment in which, as everybody hope, uh, the two uh, parts of the same coin will be integrated. Uh, mm. Now we see them a little bit separated still. Uh, the integration is there. Is our goal of all the companies and also the investors uh, to go through a, a, let's say, a, a unification of the two of the two sides of uh, the same company because uh, there is no anymore a, a strategy of a company and uh, the sustainability strategy. Uh, now is the time to integrate. And as you were uh, were saying, and your question is very important, for sure the investors, especially during crisis and volatility, are very concerned about the ESG factor because, as I said before, they realize that sustainable companies are more resilient. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, was that was that was that something that you saw, Tongi, during the height of the crisis, or? or you... well, I mean, I, I fully agree with that. I mean, and, and if you if you look at the statistics um, during the crisis of some of the ESG weighted index on the more on the equity side, to be frank, but uh, mm. it's clear that the, we have seen, um, I would say, a, a wider. I mean. A, a strengthening of of the of the trend showing that uh, well-rated e companies from an ESG standpoint have other performed. That's clearly something that we have seen by many indices. And I would say I would also say that the convergence is now clearly completely um, completely organized. I think, it, by the way, I mean we just added uh, one of our key conference by Kepler Chevrolet, which is our equity broker. And I was listening to some of the broker. I was listening to some of the corporate presentation today. From the CFOs, and so not on ESG, and clearly a part of their of their natural discussion with investors is about ESG topic, about the consequence of the crisis, and the, and the fact that the recovery will have to be sustainable, and that's that's not only an opportunity but a necessity also for those corporate to see how they recover with uh, take, I mean with uh, investment that are in line with what is now expected by the society, by the regulator, and by investors. So the convergence in, in, in terms of the themes that are discussed by uh, the, the, the top management of those companies and their investors um, between pure financial and pure ESG is clear now. I mean, those subjects are not completely interlinked. Yeah. So, Ashley, um, probably a, an, an unfair question for you, but what, what, was, the, what was BlackRock's attitude uh, during the crisis? I, I know you have a very much an ESG hat on all the time, but you work for a company that's not just ESG, if you know what I mean. Um, what, what was the attitude towards credit versus ESG, and, and has that changed at all? So I would say even prior to the crisis, I think there um, there has definitely been this acknowledgement at BlackRock and across markets that um, that sustainability topics now are financially material um, and becoming more so. Um, and I would agree with Alessandro that there's definitely a convergence going on. Um, I think there are certain sustainability topics, especially around climate change, um, that we think are integral to assessing risk and reward. Um, especially as Tongi mentioned, when you enter into an environment where there is regulatory support around a lot of these themes, um, this is just being a good investor. Um, it's not necessarily carving out um, and thinking about just impact products. This is thinking about, um, you know, what is the ultimate risk reward on this portfolio and how do sustainability themes that are going on really affect that? So, um, so we saw the same themes um, over the, you know, the, the volatile couple months um, the, starting in March that a lot of the ESG products that we have, we have sister products that are the ESG version, you know, of many indices <clears throat> that those definitely did show more resilience during that backup, um, as Tony points out. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, so, um, my next question is, um, is how can issuing a special debt instrument address investors' concerns about a company's ESG characteristics? Slightly naughty question, and, and I'll put that to Tongi to start with. 
<laughs> I'm happy to take those naughty questions. I think I love this question, you know, Toby. I mean, <laughs> that's a that's a great one. I think uh, we have you have heard several times in this type of panels, and and I really support this idea. I mean, the green green bonds or sustainability bonds, to some extent, before being a product, they're a process. And I know that from having advised a number of those players in this in this in this market and a number of integral players, including Alessandro, in this market. Clearly, uh, the process uh, of issuing a green bond when it's a first of a kind, or the process of issuing a sustainability bond with the process of, when it's the first of a kind, mobilizes people within the company at a level that shows that this company has a governance that goes beyond the average. That is really structured so that people work together, structured so that sustainability is on top on the agenda on the agenda and not uh, just a nice to have. And clearly before providing with investor with the accountability and the transparency, that is very interesting. It shows the quality of the governance at the at the company level. So green bonds, social sustainability bonds, they are not E or S product. They are G product. They show the governance of, of and I would you know I would even say that for sovereigns, I mean, I, I, again, I have spent a number of days with the, with the German ministries preparing for the green bond, and it shows uh, the alignment of different ministries from different parties. But the ability to work together on a given project, it shows uh, a level of maturity, um, and that that is very interesting information for investors. Uh, okay, uh, Shrey, anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely echo uh, Tongi's comments. So I think even if you start looking at sovereign risk models, which now incorporate climate, the act of issuing a GSS bond uh, puts you at an advantage. Because as Tongi says, you know, you've gone through uh, the process of implementing the four pillars of the Green Bond Principles, which, uh, you know, are, are material. Uh, and we see this when we're in conversations with a number of, uh, you know, emerging market uh, issuers as well, uh, just the act of setting up processes to uh, for management of proceeds or project selection sometimes allows uh, entities, whether they be uh, you know utilities companies or things to assess their portfolios in a much more holistic basis than previously. Uh, so I completely agree. You know the act of issuing uh, or going through the process of setting up a framework and setting up your governance itself presents you in a better light to uh, investors and investors are increasingly uh, wanting a more holistic strategy which will incorporate ESG in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in in the full form um, I think it's cru that what you just said is crucial as long as the investors are demanding it because I guess behind my question is perhaps um, something I think is worth saying which is as as this as, as ESG finance becomes more widespread, it becomes more commoditized and, dare I say it, slightly easier to, to do because more of it's being done and you can follow various, you know, existing frameworks. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it, is there as much discipline, I guess, as there was, let's say, five years ago, um, Ashley and, 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 and Yarek? Yeah, so, so, you know, getting back to your question on like, how does a debt instrument address investors' concerns, yeah. really, you know, I would say like when you construct a, a portfolio, um, and oftentimes um, you want to have broad-based exposure to a number of different sectors, you don't want to create a sustainability portfolio that's all tech companies and, and banks, right, because there are sectors that maybe, you know, don't have as strong sustainability characteristics as others currently. I think that you know there has to be an acknowledgement that um, that while we hope that you know all companies are on this journey and becoming more sustainable, then indeed you know many of them are not quite there yet. Um, but as Tanya points out, are trying, um, are putting uh, spending plans into things that are you know very sustainable that you know a sustainable sustainability fund would like to support. And so that in that way, I think some of these use of proceeds bonds can be really helpful um, mm -hmm. in constructing portfolios. Um, you know, the, the old school way of doing, um, you know, an ESG screen, if you will, maybe to have a coal screen or something like that. There are very, there are nuanced stories now. There are companies that maybe, you know, would be screened by an old school screen that maybe, you know, maybe you do want to invest in, that you do want to help transition. Um, and so having those carve outs, I think, is really helpful from a portfolio construction point of view. Um, and then to your, to your question about, um, 
you know, what's changing. I would say that, you know, I think there are more eyes on this market than ever before. Um, I think that um, issuers and underwriters, um, thank you, uh, are being really careful about what they bring to market. I think the threat of greenwashing is just, um, is scary. You know, we don't really want to go down that road for a lot of issuers. Um, but, you know, we are doing things as the market grows to help um, to flush out, you know, what, what are the better products? And so, you know, at BlackRock, we have, um, which a number of you know, we have a shading system that we apply to the green bond space. So we have dark green, medium green, light green. So we evaluate all bonds that come in um, and we put a scoring on them that's available to all our PMs. And we have a taxonomy around that. Um, and just recently, we've had enough social bond issuance this year that we've been able to now come up with a social bond taxonomy, which we didn't have last year. Mm. We didn't really have enough to go on. And so now we have a dark gold, medium gold, light gold taxonomy. I would say that it's in beta, that we're testing it out. Um, but trying to come up with what are the different thresholds and, you know, what do we consider best in class within the sector? And, um, and certainly the more transparency, and the more reporting we get, which we get in those use of proceeds bonds, um, that's inc incredibly helpful. Okay. Uh, Yarek. Yeah. Again, Toby, I, I, I would dis disagree with your thesis and per perhaps I would love to agree with you that it's commoditized and maybe the day-to-day -day job would be more boring, but it doesn't feel as a structure originator because uh, we're having more and more types of structures, uh, different products, both within the fixed income space and and outside of fixed income. So, so we're looking at a wider array, and and also we're getting constantly new industries coming, trying to come to the market, uh, new types of structures, new demands from uh, investors. Investors getting certainly more and more sophisticated, uh, what they require and. Partly driven also that asset owners also have more specific mandates and more specific tasks. So uh, I, I think we're far from it, it certainly helps that there are precedents out there and, and there's more and more guidance. And we've seen that, for example, with social bonds, when, when in March, it was kind of um, free for all. There was there was not much guidance. And then ICMA quickly came out with. A Q and A, and then updating the social bond principles in in June. So, yeah, but I think we're we're far from this being a area that's threatened of being commoditized. Then, and and, 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 also, and also, also also even looking, for example, specifically at insurance companies. There, there was an interesting uh, EOPA study from from the insurance regulator last year. And and they were showing that for insurance companies, and of course you could argue that it's it's not a huge universe, uh, but they were showing that not even issuing a green bond, what effect it has, but just and and that's going back to what we've discussed earlier, just establishing a green bond framework and announcing it, there's positive read across to the equity price. So yeah. I, I think that's another example showing that this is not a commoditized market because just establishing a framework then would not shouldn't have any kind of effect in a way okay okay um good point um just uh moving on and i think tongi's already referenced this but um germany and sweden have issued their first green bonds um i hope it wasn't too much work tongi but i'm sure it was it was probably a huge amount of work but um um Germany, but will more follow these bonds? And and I think probably the more interesting question is: Do sovereign bonds fulfil a useful purpose? Um, Tongi, why don't we start with you because you have direct experience with it? This is welcome, open to anyone, really. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of interesting to hear also um, investor view on that. I think um, because clearly the target of those transactions are investors, um, and the idea. Um, well, I mean, there is more to come. I think the fact that uh, Germany, which is kind of a reference issuer, at least in Europe and probably elsewhere in Europe, coming to the market uh, is, is a very strong signal uh, that um, that there is a large volume that will come and that uh, this is taken seriously by those type of players. So in, in terms of, I would say, a signal to the market about the liquidity of green bonds uh, and the availability of green bonds, this is very interesting. So there is indeed more to come and many uh, European states have announced they will do that and also outside Europe. So there is no surprise about that. Okay. In terms of the type of expenditure, there is also a specificity by the sovereigns because uh, they don't have capex. I mean, the sovereign doesn't really have this type of notion. So you need to look at the type of expenditure that a state 
uh, is doing and uh, that have long lasting impact uh, either on other capex or other investments or on the, the ability of the society to, to cope with climate change. Uh, and, and in that sense, uh, I would say Germany has added uh, expenditure that are um, in line with what we have seen from the other European countries, but clearly large amount related, for instance, to uh, research, academic research, research, and, and also international developments, which are, I would say, the signature of what you can see in this type of state. Um, <clears throat> so there is a, there is certainly a, a very important room for, for sovereign in this market with other type of sovereign that may also tap the market more from energy market, and that are, play also an important role in, in, in bond market. Um, so that's, that's I would say, they, they play a role in the provision of liquidity, they play a role because they also underline some of the aspects of climate change, which is that we need we need some public infrastructure if we want to be able to cope with this challenge. It's not only a question of the corporate investing, but also the sovereigns providing with the right. And that, and I would say last but not least, uh, it's also very important that um, sovereigns give the signal that they take this market seriously uh, and that they want to be active there um, because uh, it's a sign for all players. I mean, when the sovereign is doing it, of course, the corporates and uh, to have also some Good reasons to to follow suit, um, and 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 it means also that sovereign probably will play a role in the governance. Will have their word about that, and then the discussion with their natural buyers, which are central banks, may also invite those players to dedicate portfolio. So there is, I mean, the positive in that indirect effect are very very important for the market. Um, I mean, Alessandro, as as a as a seasoned issuer of ESG bonds. Um, um, do you think having sovereigns in the market helps your cause or indeed any other company's cause? For sure. Would it help you if Italy did a green bond or a sustainability bond? Uh, Italy is starting, I mean, according to what uh, I, 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 I see and I hear, is starting, uh, like uh, as Spengli said, a lot of other uh, countries are doing because it's very interesting. And uh, as always, I always said, uh, is the first move. Uh, we already debated during this uh, this conversation that uh, is the first step for uh, putting a little bit of discipline and also to engage internally a lot of management a lot of people in, inside every single company because they have to sign a, a framework they have to I mean, put their face on the framework so uh, uh, up to some years ago most likely there was there was the, the risk of greenwashing now that the market is experienced that now are more than a decade since we see a lot of instruments in sustainability finance, sustainable finance. I think that the reputational risk prevent a lot of company uh, from, uh, say, playing around uh, with their name. So, uh, for sure, uh, government has always set up benchmark uh, that are very, very important for everybody. Uh, so I think that they are needed, they are necessary, and we welcome that. Uh, so, but you know that uh, when also we have spoken about uh, uh, strategy, how how can we how can the investor really rely on a strategy of uh, a company? The first step, as I said, could be the use of proceeds, as we also we have done successfully for some years. Uh, I think that going forward, not just to uh, say sponsorize too much what we have done, but uh, uh, going ahead uh, in order really to be to be sure that. Uh, the, the strategy as a 100% convergence with certain objective, uh, uh, we're going to have to set up objective uh, and KPI. And I don't know if uh, there will be a uh, time in which also government will do the same. But for the time being, uh, we need uh, this ma market to mature. And so we were missing uh, this big issuer that our government, the big issuers, mm, I say, arena that are the government. So we, we really welcome that. Okay, thank you. Um, Shrey, I know that you've worked closely with Fiji, Hungary, Hong Kong, Chile, probably a few more. Um, how have they helped? Have they, I mean, in your mind, have they have they raised the profile of, of green finance helpfully? Yeah, and I mean, just to draw our two points that Tongi and Alessandro mentioned. So, one, I think we've reached a point where there's a certain amount of robustness, right, where if you don't issue in the market credibly, uh, then investors who have now seen a few issuances can, can see that, and they can see that in your green framework, the, the, the shades of it, uh, and the nature and structure of the issuance. But secondly, I think 
the impact of the signaling or the demonstrative effect is pretty important. Uh, and I think this is more true outside developed markets because for uh, emerging markets, you have a range of local players, whether it be you know lead local banks, uh, audit firms, uh, ratings providers, uh, CSCs, exchanges, who normally get involved in an, in a, an issuance. And the act of the issuance itself is a, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's an educational process. Uh, and it does um, signal to the rest of the market the importance of sustainability as part of the sovereign strategy. So companies which are listed on the, the blue chip exchange segment of the local market pay attention and they want to do the same. Uh, and investors pivot to it as well. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, it is hugely important, uh, even though in terms of additionality, I think um, perhaps uh, there's more to be seen. So Ashley, I imagine you, you, on the one hand, be a supporter of uh, sovereign green bond issuance because it raises the profile of the asset class in the market. But do you sometimes think, as a, just as an investor looking for a return, you think, eh, whatever, or uh, are you? No, I don't think that. I think these are <clears throat> incredibly welcome. Okay. I think when you construct portfolios, you need to have exposure to lots of different issuers and asset classes. I think getting sovereign exposure here allows us to have an option in you know developed market sovereigns for sustainability tilted portfolios allows us to be well rounded um, to have you know liquid instruments um, so it's definitely a welcome addition I think hopefully we see more of it I think also it goes very much in line with um, with the EU sustainability taxonomy and I think it begs the question on a go forward basis you know <clears throat> as we try to incentivize more private capital spend for mitigation, do we introduce the concept of some sort of regular regulatory support mechanisms for this asset class? And then can we change the way that capital is allocated within companies through um, potentially more advantageous funding levels for issuers? And I think that's where we really get to the heart of creating impact um, and actually changing capital flows. Okay. Um, just sticking with the subject of sovereigns for a second. Um, so Luxembourg has issued a sustainability bond. Um, I guess governments could issue huge amounts of social bonds backed by health or social security spending. Um, Yarek, starting with you, would that be a good idea? Something that you would be in favour of? Yeah, I'll just mention that Luxembourg is not the first to do so, and and here Europe is not a, not not in the leading position, which uh, it tends to be in ESG. We, we we've had obviously. Uh, Ecuador doing a social bond earlier. We had uh, Guatemala doing a social bond in, in response to COVID-19. Uh, we had bonds coming from Korea. And to, to me, I think the kind of add, adding social, I, I would see it being beneficial, especially for smaller countries, which might not necessarily have sufficient uh, eligible qualifying expenditures to, to be able to issue in benchmark size and uh, so, so not to have to pay liquidity premiums to to reach um, a certain size. So, but again, I I would like to see ideally this being done as part of a wider plan. So, for example, like Luxembourg, they have a national development plan that it's not just looking what I happen to have in my bud in my budget in previous year's spending, and actually being part of some kind of transformation. Ideally, also tied to uh, SDGs and. And going back to what Alessandro mentioned on the sustainability KPI linked, we, we, we were having discussions with one sovereign who was considering an idea of, of issuing a sovereign uh, ESG bond with, but instead of being use of proceeds based, being based on KPIs, and I, I cannot on the record, unfortunately, disclose which particular sovereign, but I can just say that it's outside of the European Union. It sound, sounds complicated. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, I think that uh, um, sooner or later we 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 can go there. Uh, it's not a question of uh, putting uh, every single instrument against each other. We need all the instruments together in order to make of the sustainable finance a mainstream. For example, we have uh, tried also to uh, com let's say debate with the European Commission a possible idea of uh, some subsidies. Uh, on the cost of debt, to the extent that is sustainable, that could uh, really trigger an increase of investment in Europe for the recovery plan. 
so uh, we have to everybody to do our best in order to try to uh, make of the sustainable financing uh, the mainstream. Otherwise, we're going to continue to speak for years about, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a product uh, reliable. So the fact that this one government is studying or trying to study a possible step forward, uh, this is not meaning that uh, the use of proceeds uh, doesn't guarantee, uh, like the SDG or the KPI link, a guaranteed discipline. All the different products guarantee discipline to the extent that are reliable. To the extent that I am able to demonstrate that my KPI at the government level, at the corporate level, at whatever level, is reliable, measurable, I think that uh, we have to stop a question if the user proceeds uh, guarantees more investor in respect of the other, other product. And uh, we need all the product to, let's say, convene together. Okay. Um, okay. Um, no, I, I, you know what? We, I think we will go back in a minute to sustainability link finance, um, but I just want to bring in something else which I mentioned in my opening um, introduction, which was that, um, which is around transition bonds. And so now that the taxonomy has defined transition activities as sustainable, um, is there any need for transition bonds? Uh, Tongi. Uh, for the moment, the, 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 the taxonomy is still in draft format. I, uh, it's already uh, well advanced, but it's not completely fine. I mean, the delegated act, I won't enter into all the details of the European calendar, but the delegated acts are not published yet. And when they be published, they are not on all um, activities. I mean, there are a number of sectors that are not covered for the moment. So, in fact, for the moment, we still need transition bond from my standpoint, because it's a way to discuss of what is at the boundary without having to kill each other to say if it's green or not, which I think is useless. I think we need to have some projects that are on the boundary, and we all have our definition. So, transition is a way to, to I mean, organize this dialogue. Of course, when the taxonomy is out and with a clear definition of what is transition and what is not, there is a bit less need in Europe, at least for transition bonds. But um, Europe is not the only place in the world where we issue bonds, so there might be also need outside Europe to discuss transition. And specifically, uh, if you look at the asset that we have used in transition bonds, for instance, the transition from coal to gas um, in some areas, which clearly is saving carbon or uh, the development of some shipping capacities, uh, this is not very related to Europe, actually, this is more important in other areas in the world. So that's why I think this concept keeps on having some validity. Yeah. Anyone have anything to add there? I'll, I'll, I'll add. I think I think those are all fair points. <clears throat> I would say that I think the question that we have is transition to what? And I think when we look at the taxonomy, um, that there's very helpful clarification. I think we've heard this, um, you know, out of the working group at the GBP is that um, it's, you know, proper transition is transitioned to carbon neutrality in 2050. And I think that if you are, if you are working on projects that are on that pathway to carbon neutrality, then arguably, they are mitigation projects and they should belong in a green bond format. Now, I totally understand the sensitivity um, of labeling green. Um, we're getting a lot of different labels coming on the market. We have blue bonds and gender bonds and transition bonds and climate adaptation bonds, et cetera. Um, I think oftentimes those do a lot of times fit under the umbrella of green bonds. And I think the sustainability taxonomy is, is doing a very uh, a big service to the market by helping us decide what those are. Um, I think that it's um, it's not something where I think we could have a special carve out for use of proceeds for projects that we would maybe consider light brown. That's probably not somewhere where the transition bond label um, is something that we would use in sustainability portfolios. Um, and hopefully, as we get more clarification, um, we can use these in green bonds. And, and you know, to that point, I think that is one of the reasons why we do shade green bonds. Um, clearly, some are. Um, are stronger than others, um, whether it's from their framework or the projects they're funding. And um, certainly we want to help fund, you know, all those projects that are helping make a difference. I just think that there, there needs to be some line between what's truly transition and what is not. Okay. Um, anyone else? Yes, Shreya. 
think it's healthy to have a debate uh, of the existential need for transition bonds or not, because it helps bring in a number of issuers who may not naturally have considered the green bond market as a market where they could issue in, to start thinking of what projects do they fund, what their strategy is in the longer run, are they aligned to Paris or not, can they be aligned to Paris, uh, do they have the governance frameworks in place, and what is their carbon performance over a period of time? And, you know, this conversation wasn't happening at the time of Paris, and the fact that it's happening now, I think, in itself, you know, justifies uh, the, the desire for an appropriate funding instrument. Now, I think, uh, you know, all of us are part of a um, working group which is looking at climate transition bonds are involved in ICMA in various forms. So I don't want to prejudge, you know, what the discussion would land on, but uh, from our perspective at the LSC, we ran a consultation with issuers last year asking this exact question, uh, you know, to you broadly as a set of issuers who are in different sectors on our market, feel that you can participate in the green bond market if you're funding green eligible project, projects. Uh, and we would have been happy to receive a, a unanimous yes, but actually we received very, uh, a very mixed answer, uh, which for us points towards you know, the need for you know, transition bonds as, a, as an asset class. I think ultimately it's important for investors to know what they're funding, right, and issuers to be clear about what they're funding, mm -hmm. and certain levels and of, um, of of standards which are out there to so that an issuer is taken seriously. So, what sort of disclosures do they make? Do they disclose under the CFD? Uh, are they uh, aligned to Paris or not? And I think the discussions around uh, transition bonds will will help us get there. My question is, can sustainability-linked bonds, which are not included in the EU green bond standard, thrive and be rigorous? Uh, and is there a danger that this market has tried to standardise them too soon? So I'm a, I'm a big supporter of sustainability bonds. So I think no, no doubt that, yes, this, this uh, product uh, can thrive and it can be rigorous, uh, that's for sure. Uh, I think that's a fantastic instrument because we have outside the green bond market a number of players which are outside the green bond market for good or bad reason uh, and can use this tool. Um, there are many companies, for instance, which do not have capex, but they have big opex. For instance, I don't see how you can issue a green bond based on opex. And I think, in fact, the fact that they could use such a green bond would be a fantastic tool. Um, there are also some players which are in industry which are considered for good or bad reason are not green enough or and, and that can use um, this sustainability bond to, to show and to demonstrate how to transform their business model. So that's a fantastic tool for that. And so clearly, uh, um, we have seen on the loan market some trades that were probably a bit too lax on the loan market because of the private private nature of the loan market. But I think on the bond market, uh, if you are like NL and Alessandro did, will have to be ambitious. And so for this reason, I think this is also the right market to use this type of instrument. Now, of course, as we have on the green market, the risk of defining as green something that is not green. We have in the sustainability market something that is more difficult to define as ambitious, something that is not ambitious. And it's probably even more difficult to define what is ambitious and what is a relevant ambition. So we'll have to, de we'll have to create the benchmark, we'll have to create the methodologies, we'll have to create the best practices in the market. We need time for that, just as we have needed time on the green bond side. So there is always a risk of going too far, too fast. Um, that being said, guidelines are very important for investors and issuers to enter in such a market because otherwise many issuers don't have, are not as bold as NL and, and they will not enter it. We need to have those guidelines and we need step by step, I would say, in fact, to define uh, together, uh, I would say investor, issuer and underwriters, what is uh, what is feasible in terms of ambition and what is uh, what what is desirable in terms of ambition and how we frame it? But I'm confident we're going to do that because um, as we add on the green bond market, the risk and it's of green, of being accused of not being ambitious enough is a very important risk, very serious, and I think no corporate will take it. Um, um, so uh, so I hope so, and so for this reason, uh, I, I'm I'm quite optimistic about the development of this. Um, certainly, sustainability-linked loans have taken off very sharply. But Alessandro, have you been surprised, disappointed, even that no other um, or not many other companies have followed your lead um, with your pioneering 
uh, bond must be what a couple of years ago now. I would say no, because uh, as all, all the innovation, let me say, uh, need uh, some time to be digested. And uh, your question is very interesting because uh, you said that uh, uh, probably there is danger that the market has tried to standardize uh, those instruments too, too soon. I would say no. Uh, we have uh, the, as I said before, the experience of uh, ages uh, about taxonomy, about the green bond principle. Now we have to be uh, ready to, uh, to, to innovate and to accept innovation and also to put discipline on innovation. Mm. Addressing your question, would you expect someone to come? I'm sure there are a lot of people uh, that uh, are thinking to come. Uh, we hear that uh, there are companies that are, have started also some process uh, in order to speak with investors uh, and to do the same. Uh, I would say uh, it is uh, a brave uh, uh, step. It's not an easy one because, uh, as I was uh, saying before, there is a reputational risk, that, as, as Tangi also said, that is higher in respect of the advantages that such a kind of issuance can take it to you. Uh, so. Uh, we come back to the, sim the, 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 the most simple things. Uh, we have to define, everybody has to define reliable KPI that can be measurable and can be understandable. So it's not an easy task because uh, uh, we were lucky that uh, to have uh, already started the process some years ago at the strategy level by which we already had some certain and defined KPI with a track record. It is not easy. So there is a big job to do in order to uh, say demonstrate to the market that you are reliable this is the reason why most likely in the last year we have not seen someone replicating this instrument but the fact that uh, for example ICMA as uh, are up i would say on trying to put discipline is a very positive step and uh, most likely the market need to standardize a little bit and to have uh, to see other issues uh, before probably we may refine it and this will not be the last product or the most innovative one most likely some other product will come with the same attention that nobody should have to play with his own name or with his strategy uh, because that would be really, really um, bad for, for the performance of the company. Um, okay, um, so I think, I think um, if we don't mind panelists, we'll have last comments around this particular subject if that's okay. Um, we're, up, we're at 52 minutes already, so um, time flies when we're having fun. Um, so, if you don't mind, we might we might finish on this particular subject. Um, who, who'd like to comment? Ashley, for example, um, a, a, um, a sustainability linked bonds uh, something that you personally like and that you would advise your your, your investors to get stuck into. Uh, yeah, I think there are. I mean, I just I don't want it to be lost that there on you know, that there are lots of ways to look at companies that are outside just a particular bond issuance whether it's a green bond or a sustainably linked bond, you know, we look at a number of factors um, at the company level. And I think there's a lot of innovation going on out there in terms of viewing companies forward commitments. So whether a company has set science-based targets, for example, whether a company, um, and Alessandra, as your company has done, has set executive um, remuneration tied to some sustainability goals. Um, all those things really help us understand, is this company in transition or not? Um, and I think that those kind of indicators can be used in portfolios in the same way um, that just a specific, you know, individual bond can be used. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, there's some questions in the market that we'll need to, you know, flush out. And one of them is, you know, are these created, uh, creating structured notes? Do those create some complication for certain investor, you know, investment management agreements, et cetera? Um, but, you know, clearly, I think you know, the guidance that we've seen out of ICMA is to have um, some really defensible, strong um, standards. And I think that that is only helpful. Yeah, it's just something that um, product that Nimura likes and will help its issuers to to to, to actually formulate and, and, and launch onto the market. Uh, yeah, most most definitely, and with, with our strong Asian presence and, and Japan, lo looking at the structure of uh, economies there, we very often discussing with issuers who appreciate the importance of joining joining in on the sustainable transformation, but simply struggle to have uh, qualifying eligible assets or either in sufficient amounts or of sufficient types. So the potential solution is either transition bonds once this emerges in a more bedded down form or sustainability KPI linked bonds. And 
I'll, I'll just mention that we're currently mandated and probably in the next month, you'll see the first Japanese sustainability KPI linked transaction coming to the market. Exciting. And Shrey, does, um, I mean, does, does the, do these types of bonds when they're KPI linked, is it more of a headache for you as an exchange, for example? Um, well, I'd like to say that nothing is a headache for us but when you <laughs> operate a market infrastructure. It's a, it's a tough business. Uh, look, I think what, what sustainability linked bonds did uh, for us really well was it helped identify that there are two different sets of instruments. There's a, a use of proceeds world, and there is a world outside the use of proceeds world uh, where, uh, you know, you can issue ESG or sustainable financing instruments uh, as, as long as you do so in a particular manner, right? And sustainability linked bonds have helped establish that. Uh, and as Alessandro says, and uh, you know, Ashley's mentioned that that doesn't mean that you know innovation is going to stop. It doesn't mean that investors are not going to pick one type of instrument and they'll pick another. People will pick companies who have a cogent, articulate, well thought out strategy. Uh, and you know, SLBs or um, transition bonds are a means for companies to do so and for us to use our networks to uh, allow companies to do so. Uh, so it's helpful. We have a sustainability linked bond segment now. So uh, for any new sustainability linked bond transactions, we'd be keen to see it on our, on our market too. Okay. Okay. Um, well, super. I think, um, I think we'll close it there because uh, we, we are literally running out of time. Um, we of course do have um, the Q and A session, um, live Q and A session with with listeners. Um, so before we head off into that, I want to just say a very very big thank you to my panelists, Tongi, Alessandro, Shrey, Ashley, and Yarek. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the live Q and A session following um, uh, the panel discussion that we've just had on on uh, sustainability linked finance uh, great uh, great panel and um, very pleased to say that we we have all the panelists still with us so alessandro tom ashley yarek and shrey um now i'm going to slightly hijack this q and i'm afraid because given the seniority and the experience that we have on this panel i think it's too good an opportunity to to, to not ask them about what do they think about the EU's uh, green and social bond issuance plans. Um, it's a massive event in this market and indeed in the entire capital market. So, um, Tongi, I'd like to start with you, really. What, what do you think are the key questions we, we should be thinking about ahead of this issuance? Thank you, Toby. Um... Well, I think I mean my 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 first thought is that um, it's a massive event for 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 European citizens before anything. I mean the fact that all countries borrow together is a is a fantastic news. Uh, um, as I told my children when they ask me uh, what does it mean, I say that when you start to live with someone, you can buy something together and then borrow together, and it means that you're bound with someone for some time, and then you can go further. So I think it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's first thing that is very important. I think for the green bond market, in fact, that is a, that is very important. Uh, it will provide the market with the depth and liquidity and a very solid issuer. It's also showing the way and showing the path uh, to follow for all issuers in the eurozone and beyond. And so clearly, that's a fantastic development. Now, of, of course, there are a number of questions to be addressed. Uh, I think uh, they are not coming in a market that. Um, where, where no one has issued. Um, in fact, uh, primarily the member states have already been very active. France, the Republic of Germany, Belgium, and many others, Netherlands. And so clearly the, the question of the boundaries um, between um, what belongs to the Commission and what belongs to the states in terms of eligible expenditure will be a very interesting question and debate. I think it's, uh, it's, not the same, it's, it's not the same situation on the green and on the social side. On the green side, we have seen already very large green bond issuer, not so much on the social side. So, in fact, the boundaries may be a bit different on those two, uh, on those, on those two uh, topics. And so um, that would be uh, one interesting development. The other development is how this transaction will be positioned with respect to the, to the work that is being currently done by the Commission, by the Sustainable Finance Action Plan, and, and specifically. The, uh, the technical expert group that just finished its, uh, its duty and will be replaced by a platform. 
uh, how do those transactions position with the potential taxonomy on the green and social side and put the potential green bond standard that is for, for, for the non trusted draft format? So that's a very interesting question to, to be addressed. Mm. And of course, the overall governance, which is a question that we have in Europe beyond uh, beyond bonds, but clearly the governance of the management and reporting on those expenditure will be uh, will go to an interesting point. But I mean, globally, as you rightly mentioned, that is a that is a great message for the for the for the market uh, that uh, such a potentially large issuer show its uh, commitment to this market for this type of amounts. I mean, uh, this is moving the needle. And I think uh, I will conclude on that. I think uh, for all the practitioners who've been active in this market for a while, and I see my colleagues here, faces of my colleagues here, we have all been longing for the moment where really green social bonds, they represent a significant share of the market because we believe that this is the moment where really the market will start to have an influence on the transition. I think Europe could bring us there. So um, thank you, Tongi. Um, Ashley, um, you're an investor. What are the what are your key questions that you what are the questions that you need answering? Um, so you know I'd agree with what you know Tongi had to say. I think you know it's an exciting moment. I think we've been building to this for years in the green bond market. Um, we've been really positive on the concept of um, what we've seen of the EU green bond label. Um, it's very much in line with what we work on at the green bond principles and some of the work the Climate Bonds Initiative is doing. Um, and so we're excited about it. I think you know the the technical parts of it, you know, we'll work three. We were just talking about, you know, do we treat this issuance as supra or government? You know, how does it fit into indices? You know, what does it do to our global green bond funds, et cetera? Uh, but that's all good and that's all, you know, progress um, in the name of, you know, getting green bonds to be able to really change capital allocation in, in the entire economy. Yeah, I mean, you raised an interesting point about where this would sit um, indices wise, Shred, you might have a view on that. I'm going to have to check with our, our FTSE Russell World Government Bond Index colleagues, but look, it's a, it's a momentous occasion for Europe, and I think uh, other large sovereigns will take notice in giving funding requirements now. Um, you know, I sit in London. I'm sure the UK DMO is paying a um, you know, very close notice. Mm. Um, a number of other panel members sit on our Sustainable Bond Market Advisory Group, and I'm sure the issuance will be talked about in um, in in great interest. Yeah. Interesting point that about the DMO. Um, Yarek, anything to add there? Um, and then I'll we'll get on to you, Alessandro. But Yarek, yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be some time until we actually see this come to the market because it's looking how the program is set up and 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 the whole new, next generation EU funding. It, mem member states, uh, the national authorities first are tasked to identify the underlying projects, and they, then they need to submit it to approval by the institutions in Brussels. So for me, it's gonna, going to be also interesting to see how much of what is submitted will actually qualify to be green eligible and 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 how, how that would fit in. But but I think it's, it's of course, a, a huge development and, and apart from you know, giving more depth, liquidity and maturity to the whole market, I, I think it will also help because because unbelievably there are still investors who do not focus in this area and and with having so much uh, s such an issue and with such size come to the market I I think this will put it firmly on on everyone's radar. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, Alexander, sorry, Alessandra, as an issuer, um, presumably the EU is going to help you or 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 not. What do you think? Uh, it's it's going to help all the sustainable company because they not only have shown the commitment versus some target, but now they have blessed that is the only way to find a sustainability is sustainable finance. Whatever instrument, whatever label you're going to go and uh, you decide to utilize, they have shown the path. Mm. So indirectly, for companies that are devoted and committed, uh, is an advantage because there is someone. Uh, the below, uh, above us, that is uh, blessing the way in which we should have to finance ourselves in the in the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Alessandro, sticking with you, and if we could just sort of return to the topic of sustainability linked finance. Now, obviously, NL was first out there with the sustainability linked bond. Um, last Thursday, we saw uh, Susano, a Brazilian pulp and paper producer, issue a seven hundred and fifty million dollar. Um, sustainability linked bond tied to the company cutting its greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions by 50% over 10 years. Um, 
uh, with the coupon increasing if it doesn't hit certain targets. Now that that deal has been sold, um, what do you think about it? And we've, of course, seen Novartis come with something too. Yeah. Um, I guess um, it's great that we've finally seen a couple of deals to follow yours, but what, what, what do you and our panelists think about those most recent deals? Uh, I think that is uh, quite normal that uh, some company have started to look at uh, uh, their own uh, uh, balance sheet, their own plan, and also to uh, decide and to evaluate if they have some particular reliable KPI on which they can build up uh, such a kind of story to be financed in the same way. So uh, I think that there are other companies that are doing the same uh, uh, for the benefit of the investors, because uh, uh, as we said also during the, the panel, it is uh, very much important uh, to have discipline uh, and to choose uh, and to validate uh, the right KPI. So they have done their own homework. Uh, they thought they had some good KPI to present to the investor. And so they have chosen this way. Uh, we have a good experience of green bond in which investors uh, in the last uh, 10 years felt, felt comfortable with that, uh, uh, with the discipline that the market has attributed to the green bond. Uh, now we have another instrument that has proven to be effective at the same way, complementary to the ones that we had before. Thank you. I know that we touched on this subject during the panel, but um, you know it, it raised six billion, uh, or it, it attracted six billion of orders. Ashley, does that worry you slightly that it's a bit frothy? Uh, well, look, I think you know we're in the context of environment where there's a strong bid for you know lots of corporate bond issuances in the market. So I don't know if I'd read too you know so much into deal sizes right now. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think that Alessandro, you know, hits it on the head by saying, you know, we really have to think about the KPIs that are selected. You know, are these the right KPIs? Are these KPIs that issuers care about? Are these KPIs that are set at, at levels that are ambitious enough to be meaningful? Um, do they make a difference? You know, do they change the sustainable profile of the issuer? And um, I think the market's just feeling its way through that. Mm. Tongi, how about you? Um... It's a great result, I guess, to show the issuer, but does it, show, does it tell us the real story? Well, I think it does. I think I think my I, mean, I have really nothing to add to what my colleague have just said. I think and this and I think we discussed it during the panel already. I mean, this is a great instrument. Um, it's, it's, we we need to have company leading the way right now. Um, NL did it one year ago. We. Very nice that Susano is doing it also from US based company uh, from a LATAM issuer. Um, I think clearly uh, that there will be uh, this opens a, a fantastic and wide uh, ground of discussions because we knew already was, I mean, we knew all, it has been difficult to define what is green and what is not green. And so we still have some debate. That's a difficult question. Mm -hmm. The question of what is ambitious and what is material yeah. or not is going to be even wider and even more difficult to solve. But I yeah. think we have to go through that. I mean, the challenge that we have to face is a question of ambition. So we need to do that. Mm -hmm. That's clearly a, a brand new question. What is ambitious? Yes, I was going to ask you, um, you know, is there an argument that sustainability linked bonds could actually be seen as simplistic because they drive investors to concentrate on one single target and not on the sustainability performance of a company in the round? Yeah, I mean, precisely on that, I think um, the, 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 one of the key questions for a company is to find one KPI that we, is really holistic enough to capture all the main sustainability stakes and the main sustainability challenge that the company is facing or can address. Mm. I think for NL, they did a great job and they had a very good KPI with the share of renewable in their energy mix and also with their carbon footprint. And it's an energy company, so that's a, it's an obvious metric. Yeah. There are many other areas where the metric is not that obvious, but I think it's also a very good exercise for the company to try to find what is precisely this metric that capture uh, both. I mean, what is something that is core for the business and that is also core for the, for the environmental challenge that we have. So it's simplistic. In fact, it's it's a very simple way to put sustainability in, in a transaction. But the question that we need to answer in order to assess if the deal is, is properly structured, is credible, are very difficult, but that's not a surprise. Yeah. So, Alessandro, that you know, the criticism that it may be too simplistic does that does that worry you at all, or are you not bothered? Mm, no. I mean, uh, it was quite normal the very moment in which you innovate uh, uh, with a new product. But uh, 
if you look at uh, the background of our index uh, that we have been presenting the last four or five business plan, uh, we were aware that uh, the investors would have understood uh, what is the effort behind uh, the index and the effort of the company to achieve uh, uh, the percentage of renewable and also the target of decarbonization. So uh, we felt that uh, uh, there may have uh, been some reaction, um, different reaction, but we, uh, after having double check with the investors directly, we were, I wouldn't say sure, uh, but the challenge that the investors made uh, and also uh, our discussion with them has given us also some comfort that we were on the right path. Okay. Um, yeah, Shrey, anything to add there? No, I think, um, you know, it's been, the point's been well made. What's, what's great to see a, a diversity of issuers in the market, a diversity of funding instruments. Uh, we know the, the sustainability linked loan market is also getting more active, which is, you know, augurs well, I think, for the bond market. And even if you just see user proceeds instruments for so the last three days, you've seen, uh, you know, a wide range of issuers. You've seen Burberry become the first inaugural you know, luxury company to issue a sustainability bond. You've seen Mexico do a social green uh, issuance. So you've seen Qatar National Bank do a green issuance. Each of them brings its different you know, challenges in terms of the geographies that they operate. And even though they're user proceeds instruments, it just shows the widening of, widening of the market. So I think it's, it's healthy that the market is, is diversifying. Yeah. Eric. Yeah, Eric, anything just before we finish? Well, I've, 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 I fully agree, but I go, also going back to your question, I'd, I don't think that investors will purely focus on, on just one K, KPI. I think they will still look, whether it's uh, at ESG ratings or conduct ESG evaluation, they'll, they'll look at the overall strategy and, and analyze holistically. So I don't think it necessarily means that there's this one KPI which can trigger either a penalty or a reward, depending if it's uh, met or missed. And then simply they, they disregard the whole approach. So, but I, yeah, I fully agree that this is a complementary product and, and in our view will open big swaths of the market to, to companies which simply are not able to identify sufficient amounts of eligible green or social assets as this could be another alternative. Great. Okay. Well, uh, I think we might uh, finish there um, if that's all right. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning into this, um, but especially I'd like to thank my panelists for uh, making themselves available for these questions. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Um, now, everyone listening, I'm going to ask you, if at all possible, to go back into the Hub platform where, by technological magic, you will find me about to deliver the uh, closing speech. So will you please um, make your way over there? But um, if I might just say now, thank you very, very much for joining everyone and thank you for joining over the last three days. It's been a, a great experience and I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much.